Welcome to the first episode of the Wildwood Podcast. For those of you who've stumbled across this video, the Wildwood Trust is an award-winning conservation charity whose mission is to protect, conserve and rewild British wildlife. And we're very lucky today to have the Director of Conservation, Laura Gardner, with us today. Morning, Laura. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to apologise to the cameramen, the soundmen and Laura for deciding to put this outside. <laughs> I regretted that about half an hour ago. <laughs> My hands are very cold. Um, it's February. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Yeah. But um, hopefully by summer it'll be really a good idea by then. Um, yeah. Um, so I've been working with uh, the Wildwood Trust for just over six months now and I'm absolutely blown away by how much hard work goes in in the background and we'll talk about that a little bit later but if we can kind of strip it back a little bit and go to the bare bones of you know what is conservation yeah i mean it's a really good question that is ultimately what drives us all to do what we do um you said in your introduction that we are a wildlife charity but we are dedicated to the protection conservation and where feasible rewilding of our british wildlife so we don't work with exotics so we are literally working with all of the species that are either in our back gardens, species that have once been native but are currently extinct, and species which are declining rapidly and really need our attention. So when you ask what is conservation, it's about protecting, conserving, and just preventing further declines of our British wildlife. And it's not all about species either, because each species plays or animal plays a significant role within an ecosystem. So you start losing those species and your ecosystem starts to break down. So conserving one species has a direct impact on conserving ecosystem function. And I guess there's kind of levels to it. Once you, um, once you reintroduce or, you know, a specific animal, that completely changes the entire like, ecosystem of that area. And, yeah, you know. I mean, the, the species we work with in particular um, are either species that are sort of threatened. They, all species, within any habitat provide an ecological niche. They have fulfill a function within that habitat. It's like a cobweb, everything is yeah. interconnected. And so you remove species or species become um, eradicated because of changes to the, how we use the land and the impacts we make on the landscape. That impacts all of the biodiversity that live within it. Um, so yeah, it, as you said, returning species to an ecosystem hopefully brings back some complexity and connectivity within that, that ecosystem and that habitat. Brilliant. Can you share an overview of some of the current conservation projects that are currently going on at Wildwood Trust at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, gosh, where to start? <laughs> There's quite a few. I've been here since 2018 and we were already ready punching well above our weight in terms of species protection and conservation and reintroduction. So for many years, we've been working with the um, conservation breeding and the reintroduction of hazel dormice, um, which is one of our rarest and declining species um, and is little known, but most people only see one if, if their cat catches one and brings it in <laughs> or something like that. But you know, it's a species that is, you know, is really interesting. They've got prehensile sort of, you know, sort of tails and they're sort of nocturnal, um, specific woodland. Um, they need sort of, you know, sort of diverse habitats. Um, and, they, they, it's really important that we protect them and so we've been working with a whole host of partners to bring the, the hazel dormouse back and reintroduce mm -hmm. into suitable habitat. Um, water vole, again yep. Britain's fastest declining mammal, yep. um, a lot directly impacted by the um, illegal release and, and escape of non-native American mink used mm -hmm. for, for farming, for, for pelts, uh, fur trade. Um, and obviously, you know, we need to be not only identifying which species are declining fastest, and we need to be able to react, but we need to find a way of not just taking them out of their environment mm. and breeding them, but we also need to, by putting them back, that drives the habitat restoration as well. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about some of these exciting projects, and we, we've got so many to mention, you know, sort of the dormice, um, water voles, beavers, um, the uh, bison project, actually, yeah. it, which is, it went global. Yeah, I think know, Leonardo DiCaprio retweeted it at one absolutely. point. Absolutely, <laughs> it garnered so much attention, which is amazing and it's fantastic. But also, you know, it, it also created a lot of debate because we were using the European bison to trial 
a woodland ecosystem restoration project. Mm -hmm. And this is with a number of partners. Our key partner is Kent Wildlife Trust yeah. and their landowners. Mm -hmm. um, and they own an area of woodland adjacent to our park. So using the large herbivore of the, the European bison, which is the, the closest living relative to the steppe bison that was here, mm -hmm. you know, thousands of years ago, um, we're looking at how we can put that animal back into the landscape and closely monitor the impact that animal has on restoring woodland function. Mm. And it seems to happen really quickly as well. It's like, incredible. Yeah. It's, it's really incredible because you think these, the habitats and the animals within them have co-evolved over millennia. Mm. Um, and so you put them back and things start functioning again, you know, and that, that network of relationships is, is really sort of, it's like um, a, a catalyst getting things kick-starting yeah. um, that sort of e functioning ecosystem again mm. but obviously it's got to be evidence-based yeah. so working with academic partners it's we got some baseline monitoring so we know exactly what was there before the species went back in mm -hmm. and now we can closely look at vegetation structure we can look at soil health we can look at the number of other species that suddenly as the landscape's changing and becoming more diverse and there's more invertebrates around, or the mm -hmm. soil's healthier, there's better understory in the woodland, that attracts more invertebrates, that then attracts, attracts more birds mm -hmm. um, and other species and bats, um, which is incredible. So, but you, it's nice to say, this is what we would love to happen. I'm sure it's gonna work, but you need to be able to clearly evidence that. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I wanted to bring up as well, is that obviously we see the headlines yeah. and that's sometimes someone's first introduction to one of the particular projects, but there's just, there's so much background work. I mean, sometimes like years before anything actually starts moving. Yeah, um, and absolutely. I mean, yeah. most of the projects are a minimum of four or five years in the planning wow. before we even get to the first stage of implementation. Mm. So it's not just something like on a whim we decide like, oh, we're going to start releasing chuffs. Like it's, <laughs> you know, it's very, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, how, how important is that collaboration with, you know, people like Kent Wildlife Trust and, and, and other, uh, other stakeholders? How, how important is that? Um, it's absolutely important. There's no one organisation that hand on heart can say, we can bring back missing species and we mm -hmm. can really prevent the, you know, sort of um, the biodiversity crisis. Um, we're also facing climate change. So we need to make our habitats more resilient and bringing in skill sets and knowledge and expertise from our partners makes, makes the likelihood of success of our projects far more. Um, for hire and also it brings that complexity back to that ecosystem which is what we want and we have a shared vision yeah. you know there are so many organizations with this aspiration of having a bigger better more connected landscape but it's it's how we do that and we mm. need to work together and collaborate yeah. to achieve these targets. And you said sharing as well I guess like sharing the findings of that as well so people can then take that onto their own projects and and really sort of move forward with that as well. Yeah and that, I mean that is really important I've worked in conservation since the early 80s um, and it's interesting and it's really nice to see how there's been a real fundamental shift in organizational operating mm -hmm. um, process in that historically it was very much I think not just in conservation but lots of other organizations as well it was very um, closed you know you wanted mm. um, all of the credit <laughs> for a project um, you didn't want to share information and oh. you certainly weren't, weren't going to admit when things went wrong which is not helpful <laughs> that's not helpful yeah. at all so obviously Bringing the skill sets in, working with other um, organisations is absolutely critical and also disseminating not only the positive findings, but also what you learn, what were the challenges, what could you do better? Yeah, so you were saying sometimes, um, you know, when it goes wrong, what, what are some of the, you know, some of the challenges that you face um, sort of getting a, a conservation project off the ground and, and moving? What, what are some of the challenges that you face? Well, this is all part of the process when the, the many years in, in planning, you're looking at, OK, well, if you're looking at bringing back a species that's been missing mm -hmm. um, for potentially hundreds of years, like the Red Bull Chuff, yeah. been missing from Kent for 200 years. So you need to look at, OK, well, why did it disappear in the first place? Is it something that we can do something about? Has that threat, is it historical? Is it no longer there? So potentially bringing that species back is viable. 
Mm -hmm. And so we go through the process of looking at the whole feasibility of bringing a species back. Yeah. And what obviously in that period of time when a species has been missing or a habitat has changed, you know, urbanization has happened. We've forgotten how to live with nature and wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so bringing your local communities back on board and having those conversations and saying, well, this is something we're thinking about from an ecological and habitat point of view. Yes, it's feasible to do that. But do people want that species back? You know, what, mm -hmm. what are the concerns? What would the threats be? Um, is it something that is insurmountable? Is it just we've forgotten that actually Red Bull Chuff is amazing, it's, it's culturally iconic? Or the bison, you know, the function that they have in a woodland mm -hmm. can save us huge amounts of, of man management expense. Yeah. And they do it naturally, you know, but it's, it's dispelling a lot of myths, listening to people and taking people on the journey with you. And um, that sort of community engagement, obviously, that's that's crucial. How how can people get, um, you know, if people are listening to this and like, well, I want to be involved in this, how can people get involved in, in the conservation side of things? I mean, do you do a lot of outreach to, to public when uh, when these projects are starting? So there's, to answer your question, so there's lots of ways that people can get involved in terms mm -hmm. of conserving our British wildlife, that you can rewild your garden. <laughs> you know, there's been so much um, publicity recently about, you know, if everybody's garden, the size of everyone's garden is, is larger than any one National Nature Reserve. Yeah. You know, so that's incredible. Yeah. What you do on your doorstep in your back garden is, is huge for wildlife. There's so much opportunity. Mm -hmm. Coming to Wild, Wildwood itself and visiting us, mm -hmm. um, obviously the, the membership fees and the entrance fees go directly into our conservation projects and, the, yeah. and helping us to continue doing the things we do, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, but also, when we're talking about the, the first things we start to consider when we're project planning is, as I say, we're looking at the, the, the feasibility, can we mm -hmm. logistically bring them back? Yeah. Um, but that outreach, that, that sort of community engagement is, is really critical. So mm -hmm. we do have a lot of conversations. We work with a lot of other partners who um, will do interviews, they'll do public consultations, questionnaires. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a question of, this is what we're going to do and we're just telling you it's going yeah. to happen. Yeah. It's, this is what we would like to do. How do you feel? Yeah, really including them in like, what, what are your thoughts? And I guess yeah. that dictates the planning of the, the project as well. Um, it does, yeah. because in order for it to succeed, we've got to bring everybody on board. And it's got to be a shared vision yeah. that we all want. And we are a nation of, of animal lovers. Yeah, we definitely Which is are. Which great. Absolutely. So in many respects, it makes my life easy. <laughs> <laughs> and can you discuss a specific conservation success story for Wildwood Trust that you've been a part of? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, before I arrived, I mentioned the, the hazel dormice and the water vole projects, mm -hmm. um, beavers. So is that something that we were working with Kent Wildlife Trust on bringing the beaver back in a, a trial? And this is about... Rest, restoring Fenland habitat is one of the rarest habitats mm. in, in Kent. Um, and so the Ham Fen Beaver Trial, we worked with Kent Wildlife Trust and that has really been hugely successful. Mm. And obviously now there's been so many replicated beaver trials and yep. obviously um, in October 2023, uh, the English government um, legally protected beavers. That's so a huge win, isn't it's it? It's yeah. amazing. Um, and obviously, you know, that it's not a question of tick and move on to the next thing right there's there's constant it, it's very sort of um, evolving so bringing species back is very complex because obviously we want that complexity of the habitat mm -hmm. but that also um, affects and, and impacts and influences other land users whether that's farmers um, fisheries you know mm -hmm. all of those people that have learned to live without that species are now having to adjust and learn to live with wildlife again. Mm -hmm. So there's all these conversations and mitigations that we need to have yeah. um, and taking people on that journey with us, understanding what the concerns are um, and, and having to adapt and listen and change mm -hmm. and mitigate things all the time. You know, when you're asking about what, what are the successes, it's, yes, it's about putting species back, returning complexity, trying to, to restore ecosystem function but it's also about 
reconnecting people with wildlife. Mm. You know, and whether it's people coming to the park, talking to us, a school group coming in, having a workshop. And you can see, particularly, sort of the children be inspired. They're so passionate and knowledgeable mm -hmm. about our wildlife. And to, to see them actually come and interact with wildlife or say, I'm going to go and do this when I get home. That is a huge yeah. um, success story. Um, and then we've got, you know, obviously the bison calf that was born. Yeah, again. what a great, yeah. That's brilliant to, to have this small herd living essentially as they would have done millions of years ago, yeah, thousands, yeah. thousands of years ago you yeah. know, in woodlands and seeing the impacts they're making, positive impacts on that woodland function. That's mm. a huge success. Yeah. But we're right at the beginning, mm. you know. And one of the questions that I quite often get asked is, is how do you measure success? Right. You know, for conservation. And that's really tricky because it's not as if you, as I say, right, I'm going to return red blood char. It's mm -hmm. culturally iconic. It was here. You know, returning the species can drive the habitat restoration. Right, we're going to throw a load of birds out job done walk away yeah that's not how it works at all yeah. you know so it's at least five ten years of releases and then you've got all the post-release monitoring mm -hmm. um, and then that habitat changes as well yeah so again it's it's, it's just constant evolving constant. yeah um, so yeah I think seeing people excited and enthused about um, the return of missing species mm -hmm. you know championing um, British wildlife and yeah. ecosystem restoration. That really excites me. That's a really success story. And then having changes in enabling mechanisms like legislation mm -hmm. and having members of the public really sort of lobby and push for better, greener policy that enables species to recover. You know, we're facing a biodiversity crisis, yeah. climate crisis. We can't keep dillying and dallying we need to do something quickly yeah and i think the public voice is really powerful tool mm. um, and enables us to continue the work that we do yeah and just given nature the chance because it i mean it's proven you know as, as soon as you you set up the, the the foundations for for change to happen you know they just get on with it <laughs> like the bison for example don uh, one of our bison rangers mm. um he's he took um sequential um videos just how quickly the mm -hmm. bison started moving through debarking things and you know it, it was within a matter of weeks that all they did formed tunnels through the yeah. through the woodland and we just need to give them the opportunity to actually yeah. do that yes yeah. absolutely you know sort of these these keystone species particularly mm. um, like the bison where they make such a significant impact that benefits a whole suite of biodiversity are really critical to get mm. them back and beavers and bison are wonderful examples of those types of species mm. but then you've also got more sort of like flagship species like the red bill chuff yeah where they don't actually make that much of an impact on the habitat themselves mm. but in order to bring them back you have to restore a biodiverse habitat for them in which to thrive. Mm -hmm. And then you want to connect those habitats so that pop those populations can then expand. Yeah. And so you're, that sort of, the, the Red Bull Chuff in particular, you're talking about that sort of coastal grassland, which yeah. is, you know, in Kent, you know, chalk grassland is, is really rare, but such an important biodiverse habitat. Mm. And bringing a, a flagship species back that drives and furthers that habitat restoration is really, really important. Mm. So I'm really, I love chuff. Um, <laughs> you know, red bull chuff are amazing species, but it's, they bring back better habitats for, for bats because they're yeah. invertebrate feeders, mm -hmm. they're better for adders. You know, you need the mosaic of habitat in which they can thrive. Um, it's, it's just incredible to, to see the connectivity. And as you say, yeah. it's almost like putting the cogs back in, in yeah. sort of a system and once you get they all connect and then the wheel starts turning and then it's like oh wow that's amazing <laughs> um but yeah it's it's incredible to see but it's a lot of work mm. um and you know we need to make sure we what we do we do right could you talk a little bit about the just obviously you're super passionate about chuffs and i know that for oh, sure sorry, yes, <laughs> no, no, no 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 i want to go back to it i want to what's what's kind of the the background of the chuff um just sort of talking about canterbury arms and all that kind of thing and yeah well it's it's a culturally iconic so in order when we were looking at the feasibility of bringing back the red bull chuff to kent it has been missing for more than 200 years um 
but obviously it's on the Canterbury uh, Cathedral. It's mm. on the, the, the sort of um, Canterbury city coat of arms, other civic regalia. Most pub signs in Canterbury actually <laughs> yep. have um, I the church shop that. emblem. Yep. <laughs> and then we start, you know, looking into that. Well, what, what is the cultural significance of the chaff? And then finding out the story about the, the martyrdom of, uh, of Thomas, the murder of Thomas Beckett, um, mm. and the, you know the the creation story about the chuff coming down, or it was actually a crow yeah. that came down, dabbled in the blood of the dying Sir Thomas Archbishop, mm -hmm. um, and therefore was born this, this chuff with a red beak and red legs. Such a great story. <laughs> um, which is incredible, but also then you looking back at why they disappeared in the first place. Mm. Um, and a lot of it is, is how we as people use the landscape. Um, and there's a lot of habitat change. So historically, there'd be a lot of pastoral grazing up to the coasts, um, you know, and the, the horses, ponies, livestock would, would kind of keep the, the grassland quite short and grazed. Um, but they would also, the dung produced by the herbivores would also attract lots of invertebrates into that, particularly over winter when the natural resources or the ground was frozen and the way in which the chuff feeds, obviously they, they feed on invertebrates in the soil using yeah. that very fine pointed beak. Um, so, and then as that changed, um, we used to, it was the intensification of agriculture. So we started growing arable crops right to sort of the, the coastal yeah. edges. Mm -hmm. um, the reduction of pastoral grazing, um, the use of pesticides, and then also persecution, yeah. um, so the preservation of grain act, you know, which goes back to the 1500s. Yeah. You know that pretty much put a bounty on anything that was perceived to be um, eating grain, destroying crops, or a direct threat to people. Mm. Which pretty much was anything from from birds, hedgehogs. Um, That's a long list. <laughs> everything. And, yeah. Yeah, and and some of the ways that now we can go back through records to try and find out when did species decline first start and, and how do we know that? And that correlates in a lot of cases to uh, parish records where they would be paying bounties. Uh, you bring me five dead chuff and I will pay you wow. X amount of money. And there'd be all, all of those records and it was, you know, everything from, from red bull chuff, wildcats, um, pine martins, all of the species that used to be here and used to thrive, mm. and they all co-evolved to live happily together, you know, um, and then gradually you start removing individual species, mm. and then the whole biodiversity framework breaks down. Yeah. Um, and so bringing back an individual species um, can be really challenging because you need to look at, okay, why did they disappear in the first place? Mm. The cultural connection, is it anything that, is there a fear, is there a perception around that animal that we'd need to consider mm -hmm. if we wanted to bring that species back? Sure. I mean, I'm, um, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about just the, the chuff at the moment, but I know that there's um, rewilding sort of talk about, you know, all the way up to lynx. So, yeah. I mean, you're talking about chuff and, and there's, mm. there's some, you know, com conversations with that, but there's, yeah. There, must, there must be an absolute plethora of, you know, worries that people have all the way from like pine martin as, as yeah. you start stepping up and yeah. I guess it's... And a lot of that is, is based on, um, because species have been missing for so long in many areas, you, mm -hmm. you kind of, the myths and legends take over from yeah. fact. The big and bad wolf, lot, like, yeah. Exactly <laughs> yeah. that, and it is exactly, a yeah. about dispelling the myths. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we found out about the red-billed chuff is they, because they had got a red beak, they were known as fire starters. What? And really? And they were thought to fly down to fires, carry the embers of the fires and sit on people's, on the thatched roofs of buildings and start fires. So wow. that's one of the theories about why they were You can't blame chuff for everything. <laughs> exactly. Wow. And they were seen also grazing on, on the crops. But yeah. actually what they were doing, they were feeding on the invertebrates in the soil mm -hmm. or the pests that were killing the crops. So they're actually helping. But it was it, the perception was they were actually, you know, eating the crops, which was totally inaccurate. You also said about different introduced species really changing mm. our ecosystems. Um, I think you said about mink, um, but I mean, American you, mink. Yes. Yeah, and then you've got mm. the grey, grey squirrel. squirrel, 
Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we have red squirrels here at, yeah. here at Wildwood. How big of a, an issue is that in terms of species being introduced to ecosystems? Yeah. How does that affect the, the ecosystem? I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think it's really complex. Obviously, every species will have an impact upon its environment. Um, if it's not co-evolved to exist in that environment, its impact can be devastating. Mm. So the grey squirrel, for instance, if we're talking about grey squirrels, mm -hmm. um, they're larger than our native red squirrel. So we only have one native species of squirrel in Britain, and mm. that is the red squirrel. Yeah. And in most parts of Britain, that has been outcompeted um, for all resources, food, nesting opportunities, um, by the grey squirrel, which is heavier. Um, it feeds on a more diverse um, type of, of nut and, and vegetation, um, but they also um, carry a disease mm. called squirrel pox, which the grey squirrel carries and isn't really affected by it in any way, but it's absolutely lethal to the red squirrel. So in areas where there are grey squirrel and red squirrel coexisting to a point, they soon become outcompeted not only for the resources, but also then the disease. Wow. Um, and that, that's tragic. But then you talk to probably sort of, sort of people who are maybe early 20s, they've grown up with grey squirrels in their garden. Mm. Um, there's no recollection of red squirrels, you know, apart from in Beatrix Potter, squirrel napkin, etc. Um, but it's kind of, it's in stories. Mm -hmm. They've never seen a red squirrel um, in many parts of, of Britain. Um, but they know that, that grey squirrels are here. So then you start having conversations about, okay, well, we should be trying to remove grey squirrels so that we can restore red squirrel populations. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a really sensitive debate yeah. because people are, are kind of, they love the red squirrels. Yeah. They yeah. come down to their garden feeders. and Grey so, squirrels, yeah. Yeah, sorry, grey squirrels. Yeah. And, you know, so I think that becomes very difficult because that's That's all the kids ever know and all the way through their known, life. Yeah. And they've accepted, so you don't question it. Mm. Um, that must be really tough. Yeah. It is tough. Unregulated and unmanaged, if they're thriving in, in a habitat, by sheer number, the impact they're having is, is a negative one. Mm. And they're, they're displacing our native species as well. So mm. it's that balance becomes very skewed. So talking about that kind of the difficulty between grey squirrels and uh, red squirrels, um, there's um, some talk about pine marten maybe being a potential, um, not solution, but like a help to, to that kind of um, that issue. Um, and okay. I know we have a project coming up, if you'd like to speak about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've, you know, we've focused on, you know, what we've been doing up to date and we've got some, had some exciting, you know, sort of projects um, in 2023 in particular, you know, mm. sort of going out, that was so exciting. First in a series of releases, but we're also doing project planning and talking about Pine Martin is something that is really interesting because the media have really picked up on that story of the Pine Martin being the silver bullet to sort out the grey squirrel, red squirrel issue. Mm -hmm. um, there is some evidence that having Pine Martins in a landscape where there are grey squirrels creates a, like a culture of fear um, in the grey squirrels and that has um, a negative impact on their breeding success. And so they don't reproduce as quickly. Right. And also there's direct predation as well. Um, pine martins will predate both greys and reds. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, there's a theory that actually the grey squirrels being larger and they spend more time on the ground and not as arboreal as the, the reds, okay. that they're easier to catch. Mm. What does so arboreal the, mean, just for people who oh, don't so know? Oh, so for tree dwelling. So tree dwelling, red yeah. squirrels, although they will come down to the ground, they're quite vulnerable, they're much smaller. Right. So they tend to spend most of their time in the trees. Got you. Whereas the greys will quite happily um, yeah. spend a lot of time on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's, there's some evidence um, to support that. However, it isn't this silver bullet. Um, but pine martins, again, play an important role in the ecosystem mm. um, and so we're looking at doing a feasibility to assess can we bring pine martins back into the south of England mm -hmm. there are already some translocations that have been successful yeah. of pine martins from Scotland to Wales and the forest of Dean um, which is lovely to see you mm. know where there is suitable habitat to bring those really important species back 
Um, and there is a population, and we're not quite sure what the source of the population is in the New Forest. So what we're doing is when we're talking about ecosystem restoration and we want to look at what do we need to do to facilitate our native species recover. We need to look at, I think John Lawton's report, white paper, it was bigger, better, more connected. Yeah. And those are kind of underpins all of the, the conservation Connection projects. always seems to be like a really big, like uh, I always yeah. hear about uh, corridors and... Um, exactly yeah, that. Yeah. And that is so critical because you could put an animal in a landscape, but when that animal starts reproducing, it wants to disperse. It needs mm. to move through the landscape, through the seasons, and expand when the population needs to. I was, I was reading an article about, um, uh, I'm probably getting the name wrong, but like wildlife bridges as yeah. well. So like um, th there's loads in, like in Canada that have, have really reduced um, uh, collisions on, on motorways. And yes. actually by them being built has actually saved money on, you know, um, hospital visits and, and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's exciting that these changes can be positive for, for the economy as well. Like yes, not just, absolutely. Yeah. And there's, there, as you say, there's lots of precedents, not just in Canada and North America, but yeah. also in Europe. Mm, you know, we've got similar landscapes to ours. You know, yeah. in the Netherlands, you know, it's mandatory when they're building a, a highway, they have to put wildlife bridges in. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, and, the, you know, it's something that having these conversations just about bringing Pine Martin back we're then having conversations with the National Highways and Network Rail about, okay, well, what can we do to mitigate? Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees we want to be bringing wildlife back. We want to nature to recover. Yeah. But, but there are so many features and our, the landscape has changed. Yeah. How can we help nature thrive mm. in an environment which is so modified for human? Yeah. Um, so having these mitigating gating factors like wildlife bridges is ab absolutely pivotal mm. and to facilitate the expansion of a pine martin uh, population that's currently in the new forest mm -hmm. towards southeast of England that is driving the conversation about connectivity joining yeah. up little fragmented pockets of woodland that is not just good for pine martin but a whole host of other species yeah. as well and having those conversations driving these um, discussions from not just conservation but within all sorts of you know lobbying the legislation mm. enabling these things to happen really has to go hand in hand with conservation action. That's an exciting time. <laughs> it's a really exciting time. Um, so obviously, yeah, we're looking at the, the feasibility of, of bringing pine martins back mm. or enabling their expansion into the southeast of England, mm. which is amazing. That'd be great. Um, and if we can do it in the southeast of England, we can do it anywhere, right? Mm. Um, but we're also having conversations about wildcats as well. You know, there's yeah. been breeding programs and Although Wildwood is a wildlife charity, mm -hmm. just about dedicated to native species, we work very closely with a lot of zoological collections as well. We sure. have a zoo license because we're open to the public. Mm -hmm. um, and there's such an interest in native species recovery at the moment. So we're working with a, a lot of other zoos as well um, and project partners where we, there are important populations that are managed in zoos, which are mm. genetically diver uh, diverse, mm -hmm. um, that we can use as source populations for putting species back. Right. So these are kind of the founder populations that will, in many cases, will be appropriate to use to put species back into the wild. Sure. Um, and the, the wildcats are the, the only sort of um, population that's left, is that just in Scotland now? So yes, I think, um, so we work with, um, the, the RZSS and Highland Wildlife Park, they run the stud book, right. um, which is like a, uh, I guess, a, a dating site for animals. Really. <laughs> I love that. Um, and it's like at your pedigrees. So yes. they, every individual within a population, they know the lineage, they know the, you know, sort of how, um, uh, how old it is, who, it, who its parents are, what its ancestry is, mm -hmm. and therefore they can make breeding recommendations. And that's all about protecting the genetic diversity of that yes. population for as long as possible. Absolutely. So, as you correctly said, wildcats were hanging on by a thread in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because the population declined to so small, such small numbers, they then started 
um, hybridizing with feral cats. Right. Um, and that led to a situation where functionally that species was extinct because it was so inbred. Right. So this is where working with, with particularly in this case, the Highland Wildlife Park and the, and the stud book um, for the wildcat has enabled a species reintroduction to happen because we've got that genetically diverse source population within mm. our zoos. Um, and so there's a very exciting wildcat reintroduction going on in Scotland at the moment. We are also talking to other partners about looking at conservation breeding, not only for Scottish reintroductions of wildcats, but potentially reintroductions of wildcats elsewhere outside of Scotland. And that is really exciting. Mm. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of things going on. There's so much going on in 2024. Um, <laughs> watch this space, Absolutely. our website, follow our social media, and come and visit us in the park. Yeah. And if you want to get involved, get in touch. Mm -hmm. um, on our websites, there are links to volunteering. I know yeah. we spoke about what you can do. Oh, we have some fantastic volunteers at Wildwood, yeah. but they're, they're yeah. amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, shout out to our volunteers. <laughs> Indeed, we can't do what we do without our staff and our volunteers. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure we could sit here and talk absolutely forever about everything that's going to be good and how excited we are, um, but we do have a little time limit. So I wanted to do something a little bit fun. Okay. Um, so I've got a fancy bowl here, um, sponsored by no one currently, but sponsors <laughs> out there maybe. <laughs> um, so if you could pick one and then pass it to me, I will then okay. read it out for you to answer. Oh, just one. And yeah. I'm hoping they're going to be quite silly. Um, <laughs> Nope, we're not going to do that one. That's a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> have you read it, <laughs> <laughs> I have read the majority of them. I haven't read that one. Okay. Okay. Imagine you're creating a new exhibit at this zoo. Mm -hmm. um, at Wildwood, sorry. Which animal would you include that is not already included and why? <gasps> oh, wow. That's just That's like... A tough one. <laughs> oh. That's almost as bad as saying, what's your favourite animal? Yeah, which we didn't ask. It's slightly <laughs> different. Um, I think having a, which actually is, is quite appropriate because we are at the moment, um, we've got a little bit of funding, which is very exciting, to have a, an education, Avery, talking about turtle doves. Yes. Which, you know, the turtle dove is, is it's one of its remaining strongholds is in Kent. You know, which is really exciting. But farmland birds in general are really declining. Mm. Um, so having an aviary or an enclosure where we can have lots of different species and kind of replicating a natural habitat or a farmland um, that we can recreate and, and take people back in history to mm. say, actually, this is farming historically. This yep. is what works. This is why it was so successful for our farmland birds and in this habitat if we get it right we can bring those species back or even stop them from preventing preventing extinctions mm. and stop species disappearing in the first place which would be amazing you know turtle doves are still here yeah what we need to do is prevent them declining further um, working with farmers Brilliant. and owners and, and exciting the people so turtle dove avery I, I, I know that sounds a bit lame. No, no, it's, well, I believe it might be on the way. So. It is on the way. Um, hopefully, come and see it. Fab. Um, okay, let's do one year. more and then okay. and then we'll wrap it up and say thank okay. you. So let, pick one more. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, oh, my hands are cold. Yeah, my hands are cold as well. I'm starting to shiver a little bit. Okay. What's the most important lesson you've learned? I'll start that again. What's the most important lesson you've learned from observing animals? These are good. Yes, that's a really good one. You know what? Um, ego. Ego. Animals don't have egos. Ah, okay. Very and, interesting. And actually, when you're looking at what we do, depends on partnerships and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And egos can be really detrimental yeah. to that. You know, and I think we've moved away organizationally yep. from egos mm -hmm. um, but it, you know it's, it's a real challenge actually and I think I've learned you know myself it's not about my ego it's not yeah I can't do anything without the people around me yeah you know and we're just so lucky as you said earlier mm. to have some fantastic staff and volunteers yeah. um, 
yeah, you start putting egos in the way and then yeah, everything's I think that's a, a great place yeah. to, to, to wrap it up. Yeah, dedicated, passionate yeah. people um, doing what we love. Brilliant. Well, yeah. thank you very much for taking the thank time, you, Laura. Uh, this is the first episode, so um, long thank may I continue. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Cheers. I'm Paul Whitfield. I'm the Director General of the Wildwood Trust. Hopefully you enjoyed that conversation with Laura, our Director of Conservation and Rewilding. Um, this is the first of our Wildwood podcasts. There will be many more to come. If you enjoyed it, please, please like and subscribe. We're just starting this off, so we need all the help we can get. Check out our website, check out our social media, become a member, give us a donation. Or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, now's your opportunity to do it. We think these can be very exciting, very engaging. So now's the opportunity to become part of the Wildwood family and help us make more of this amazing content.